Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Commander's Core studio. Welcome to the show. So, spoiler season has finally come to a close for both Strixhaven and C21. We got some really exciting cards from spoiler season, including a mono white mass land ramp spell. Yeah, that's something I wasn't sure if we were ever going to see. And with the final precon deck revealed, the Witherbloom deck, we got more exciting cards. And because of one of those cards, I'm calling this episode because you know. You're a forest, Harry! <clears throat> yeah, that was an absolutely terrible impersonation of Hagrid, so let's just forget I did that. Regardless, let's jump into these cards so we can find out why in the world I named this episode this weird title. And also, one last big thank you to Eddie for all of your help during this spoiler season. So if you've got the chance, please comment below and let Eddie know how great he is. And again, if I make any mistakes, let him know that it was his mistake, not mine. So let's jump into it! So this says Hagrid must be Yodora Grave Gardener. Yodora is a 5-5 tree folk druid that costs 4 and a green. It says whenever another non-token creature you control dies, you may return it to the battlefield face down under its owner's control. It's a forest land. It has no other types or abilities. Now the flavor text says even in death we never stop growing, but what it actually should be saying is even in death, green never stops ramping. That's right, all the other colors have to work for their ramp, and when you're in green, it just happens naturally. Jokes aside, yeah, that's a really powerful effect. Whenever one of your non-token creatures die, you just ramp. This can get you an absurd amount of lands, which are just creatures that are basically, you know, now forests, in play in no time. You can use a card like Birthing Pod to basically sacrifice a creature, make it into a land, go get another creature that you're going to do the same thing with. I can see this commander taking advantage of creatures with ETBs and LTBs and yeah, just getting creature after creature and making them into more and more lands. Next up, perhaps my favorite character from this entire set, Guyome Master Chef. I mean, we finally have a legendary chef in Magic, and my apologies if we actually already have a legendary chef. I don't think we do, but now we do, so let's just go with that. Guyome is a 5-3 troll warlock with trample that costs 2 black green. He has, at the beginning of your end step, create a number of food tokens equal to the number of non-token creatures you had entered the battlefield under your control this turn. Pay one, sacrifice a food, target creature gains indestructible until end of turn, tap it. So this card is actually incredibly flavorful, which is very on point because this is a chef who deals with flavor. Basically, when you have a creature come into play, this chef's like, oh wait, one second, I gotta make some food, you, you need a meal. Now you don't get that food right away because, you know, he's a chef, he's actually gotta prepare the meal. So at your end step, then you get the food for that creature. Utilizing food for indestructibility can be a very powerful thing. You can use that food to protect key creatures or to tap others down. Or you can do some completely different things like utilizing those food tokens which are artifacts for something like Croc Clay and Ironworks. Or, you know, take out your opponents with something like Marionette Master. But yeah, a potentially powerful commander and a very flavorful card. And the final new commander from this deck is Tavash Gloom Summoner. A 4-4 human warlock with lifelink that costs 4 and a black. He has at the beginning of your end step, if you gain life this turn, you may pay X life for X the amount of life you gain this turn. If you do, create an XX black demon creature token with flying. So essentially, you'd have a mono black giant life gain deck where you're like, hey, you know what, I just gained all that life, but instead of actually, you know, just keeping it, I'm gonna turn that into a giant flying demon that I'm gonna smack my opponents with. So if you're looking for a mono black life gain life loss demon deck, go for it. Next up, let's talk about Marshland Bloodcaster. She's a 3-5 Vampire Warlock with flying that costs 4 and a black. She has pay 1 and a black tap. Rather than pay the mana cost of the next spell you cast this turn, you may pay life equal to that spell's mana value. So she's kind of like a Bolas of Citadel, but without it being off the top of your library. So you can cheat out big spells from your hand or your command zone, etc, etc. Now you are paying life, but again in a game of Commander, you do have access to a lot of life. 
and getting out, say, Omniscience for 10 life and 2 mana is a pretty good deal. Now, keep in mind that you can't just cast an X spell like Exsanguinate and be like, okay, yeah, X is whatever I want it to be. Just like with Bolus of Citadel, you can't determine that X, so X is just zero. But outside of X spells, of course, there are plenty of big and powerful things that you can cheat out. I mean, if your commander costs 10 mana like Progenitus, you might be thinking about this one. Yeah, I've got to pay 2 mana and 10 life, but Progenitus, so yeah, there's that. Regardless, it will be very interesting to see where this card sees play in Commander. And once this hits the board, you've got to be very careful if you're on the other side of the table. One activation with this could be very game-ending. But next up, let's move on to Blight Mound and Enchantment for 2 and a black. It says, attacking pests you control get plus 1 plus 0 and have menace. Whenever a non-token creature you control dies, create a 1-1 black and green pass creature token with, when this creature dies, you gain one life. This is an aristocrat staple right away. When I started reading this card, I was like, who's gonna play this? Attacking pest you control, get plus one plus zero and have menace? Who's got a pest tribal deck? And then I read the second part and I was like, okay, yeah, this makes sense. This is really powerful. Essentially, whenever you have any of your non-token creatures die, you get a 2-1 with Menace that when that dies, you gain a life for a 3-mana enchantment. I mean, Open the Graves is a heavily played card, especially in Aristocrat-style decks, and that gives you a 2-2 that does not gain you life, and the enchantment costs 2 more mana. Now, yes, I should clarify that your pests only get that plus 1 plus 0 if they are attacking, but still. This gives you an absurd amount of value for all of your creatures dying, which again, in those style of decks, you're gonna have happen quite often. And keep in mind that those pests that this creates are both black and green. So players out there with Savra decks, rejoice. Next up, we've got Blossoming Bog Beast, a 3-3 beast for four and a green. Whenever it attacks, you gain two life, then creatures you control gain trample and get plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the amount of life you gain this turn. So at a minimum, when this attacks, your creatures are going to get trample and plus two plus two. But on the high end, this is going to give your creatures an absurd boost. I'm talking Crater Hoof Behemoth levels of boosting. Now that's really only going to be if you have a lot of life gain synergies in your deck, but still there's a lot of potential for this. There are a ton of incredibly hyper-efficient life gain cards in Magic. And in Commander, life gain really hasn't been that powerful of a thing. But this turns life gain into raw power that you can take your opponents out with. So before combat, you cast some sort of a life gain spell, you gain a ton of life, and then you swing with this, you gain two more life, and your creatures get huge, and your opponents are very, very dead. I mean, think about this in combination with just, say, Gary. Even if your devotion is just two with Gary, everyone else loses two life, you gain six life, and then you swing with this, you gain two more life, you've gained eight life this turn in total, all your creatures get plus eight plus eight and trample until end of turn. It's very easy to end the game with just one card in combination with this and an attack. But again, unlike Crater Hoof Behemoth, this does require a little bit more workaround to actually make work. And it doesn't have haste, so there's that. Next up, a card that helps you utilize life gain in another way is Ezeroot Channeler. It's a 4-6 Tree Folk Druid with Reach that costs 5 and a green. It has creature spells you cast cost X less to cast for X is the amount of life you gain this turn. Tap, you gain 2 life. So at the very minimum, this is a, hey, you tap this, you gain 2 life, and your creature spells cost 2 less to cast. But again, gaining a ton of life at once is really easy to do. So you can basically eliminate all the generic mana costs in your creatures on a good turn. And if you, say, have artifact or colorless creatures like Eldrazi in your deck, congratulations, you're casting those for free. Okay, I guess I should clarify, I mean the ones that just have generic cost and no other cost. Technically, there are artifact creatures and colorless creatures that do have pips. Regardless, this can mass reduce the cost of your creature spells, helping you cast creature after creature after creature. If you've got some creature-based draw spells, you're going to be drawing more creatures, casting more creatures, and having a really explosive turn. When I saw this, my first thought was, man, this actually would have made a really cool commander. But unfortunately, this is not legendary. Can't win them all. Anyways, moving on, next up there's Sprout Back Trudge. It's a 9-7 Fungal Beast for 7 green green, but this spell costs X less to cast for X the amount of life you gain this turn, and it's got Trample. At the beginning of your end step, if you gain life this turn, you may cast Sprout Back Trudge from your graveyard. So essentially, if you gain 7 life in a turn, this is a 9-7 with Trample for just 2 mana that you can also cast from your graveyard. Yeah, in a life gain deck, this is going to be a big include. Outside of life gain decks, though, this probably won't see much play, if any at all. I imagine this card might see some play in other formats. The card that this reminded me of the most is Hogak, though Hogak is definitely more broken than this. But yeah, a potentially 9-7 for 2 mana can be a very powerful thing. 
that you can keep getting back over and over again. Next up though, let's talk about Trudge Garden. It's an enchantment for two to green and it says, whenever you gain life, you may pay two if you do create a 4-4 green fungus beast creature token with trample. Okay, but really quick, in the art though, is that fungus beast punting an elk? I mean, that that's what it looks like to me, but I could be very long. Let me know in the comments below, what do you think? Regardless, this helps you weaponize your life gain. Now, you do have to actually pay to get those beasts, but two mana for a 4-4 with trample is a pretty good deal. And keep in mind that this is any time that you gain life. So if you've got repeatable life gain effects like a Sun Droplet or a Blood Artist, etc, etc, this can provide you a lot of value throughout the game. But again, like many of the cards in this deck so far, and ones that we're going to be talking about here in a bit, without life gain synergies, this card really doesn't do all that much. Or actually anything. If you don't have any cards in your deck that gain you life, then this card does absolutely nothing. And similarly, there's Vain Witch Coven. It's a 3-3 Vampire Warlock with Menace that costs 2 in a black. It has whenever you gain life, you may pay black if you do return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So in a similar way to the last card, you pay mana after you've gained life and you get a benefit. But this time, instead of getting a 4-4 beast, you get a creature back from your graveyard. I mean, I can see some pretty powerful combinations coming out of this card. For example, with something like, say, a Grey Merchant of Asphodel and a Sacrifice Outlet with a little bit of setup, you can just keep looping that. Now you need a bunch of mana to do that, but it's not going to take too many times of casting Grey Merchant of Asphodel to take out all of your opponents. And don't ask me why I just said Grey Merchant of Asphodel instead of Gary when earlier in the episode I called Gary Gary. I just did, and I'm not re-recording it, so there. Next up, there's Essence Pulse. It's a sorcery for three and a black that says you gain two life, each creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, where X is the amount of life you gain this turn. So this is a variable board wipe dependent upon how much life that you've gained. It's kind of like a reverse toxic deluge-ish. Rather than utilizing life loss, you are utilizing life gain to take out creatures. Now, obviously this card is dependent upon other cards and other effects for you actually to gain more life to take out bigger creatures. At a minimum, this can take out small creatures, giving them minus two, minus two until end of turn. But again, outside of decks that don't have life gain synergies, you're not going to be playing this card most likely. Unless you really just hate small creatures that, you know, have two toughness or less. Next up, we've got Revival Experiment, which is a sorcery for four black green. It says for each permanent type, return to one card of that type from your graveyard to the battlefield. You lose three life for each card return this way. Exile Revival Experiment. In a way, this somewhat reminds me of Command the Dreadhorde, but it's quite different and unique in its own way. So essentially, and correct me in the comments below if I am wrong, but at the most, you're going to be getting back five things. A land, a creature, a planeswalker, an artifact, and an enchantment, and that would be 15 life in total. Now, depending on what those things are and how powerful those cards can be, yeah, 15 life's going to be worth that. So I can see this seeing some play in the right kind of self mill decks. You mill yourself for a ton, get access to a lot of things, and then you cheat out your most powerful things into play with this. But speaking of getting things back, let's talk about Healing Technique. Healing Technique is a sorcery for three and a green, and it has Demonstrate. So when you cast a spell, you can copy it. If you do choose an opponent to also copy it, players may choose new targets for their copies. Return target card from your graveyard to your hand. You gain life equal to that card's mana value. Exile Healing Technique. So basically, this is a double regrowth plus life gain, and your opponent gets a regrowth. Now, getting two things back for four mana and gaining a bunch of life can be a really good deal. I mean, restock costs five mana, doesn't gain you any life, and you only get two things back as well. Now, the trade-off with this one is that an opponent is also getting something back and gaining life. Of course, you can use this in a political way as well, though. You can choose the opponent that gives you the best deal. Maybe they get something back, but they're not allowed to use that thing against you. A somewhat similar card like Skullwinder does see play in Commander, so I can see this card seeing some play as well. Next up, we've got Pest Infestation. It's a sorcery for XX and a green. It says, destroy up to X target artifacts and or enchantments. Create twice X 1-1 one, one green and black pest creature tokens with when this creature dies, you gain one life. So basically, you blow up some things and then you get twice as many pests. I really don't know how much play that this one's gonna see. It's kind of like a release the gremlins in a way, but that card doesn't see all that much play either. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, if this was at instant speed, that would probably be a different discussion. But at sorcery speed, you've got to pay three mana to just blow up one thing and give you two pests. At five mana, you get rid of two things and you get four pests. Now, I might be underrating this card, but again, I think that sorcery speed really hampers this one. Finally, though, let's talk about the Nurse's Office for Strixhaven with Witch's Clinic. It's a land that taps for a colorless and you pay two and tap it and target commander gains lifelink until end of turn. There are probably a decent amount of commanders out there that could really want this. Now, most of those commanders are probably in one or two color decks because, again, this is not helping you fix your mana. 
but it's a solid utility land for, again, those commanders that really want to just gain some lifelink. For example, if you've got a Voltron deck, congratulations, your commander's now going to gain you a ton of life for basically nothing. I mean, technically, that's three mana because you've got to pay two plus you're tapping this, so it's basically three mana. But still, having the ability to give your commander lifelink just on a land can be a very powerful thing. But now it's time for me to wrap things up and give you my final thoughts on these new cards. I think out of all of the pre-con decks, this one has the most new cards that are very specific to a certain strategy. If you don't have a deck that has any cards that gain you life, a lot of these cards really aren't going to apply to you. But if you've got a life gain deck or are really looking to make one, you've got a lot of new and exciting cards for your deck. Or if you've always wanted to turn all of your creatures in the forest, Yodora, because why not? Just remember that every single time that that happens, you are required by commander law to say, You're a forest, Harry! <clears throat> yeah, yet another terrible impression, but I'm keeping it in here, so yeah. Anyways, it's been a really fun and exciting spoiler season, and thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope that you enjoyed the videos as much as I enjoyed making them. And with that, the show has come to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again and have a good one.